Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania area. Uh, Neil has been featured in Ghosts from Coast to Coast, America's Best Ghost Investigators in 2007, and is a published author with his own book, Paranormal Chronicles, Tales of Humor, Horror, and the Absolutely Strange. Uh, I will uh, turn the program over to Neil. Please welcome uh, Neil Parks. It's funny that he cut, he said two o'clock. I kept saying that yesterday when I was telling people what time we'll be talking. So I think there's an issue with uh, time variations in Point Pleasant. You really don't know what time it is because your watch either stops or it's something to do with gravitational pulls. <laughs> of course, um, you probably have already noticed this big banner back here, it's collage. Uh, yes, I am an egomaniac, and my, my team is, is called Parks Paranormal Research and Investigation, for that reason alone. Uh, like he stated, I've been to several locations, Boston, Salem, Gettysburg. We've, we've done most of Ohio, not all of Ohio. We haven't really done most of Western Ohio, that is. Uh, we've been to New York City. Uh, I've done a lot of research and talking to people in areas as far as Jamaica, the Cayman Islands. And every year we're always doing North Carolina anyway. We vacation in that area and we tie in uh, investigating and walking through almost yearly Beaufort, North Carolina, which was once home to Blackbeard the Pirate. And there is a cemetery there known as the Old Burying Ground that is a 300-year-old cemetery where there are pirates, uh, sailors, ships, uh, shipmates, other people from ships, Civil War, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, so on and so on people buried in that cemetery. And today I'm here to talk about angels, demons, gargoyles, other types of winged cryptid type creatures and or beings, not necessarily that angels are creatures. He mentioned that, uh, the MC just mentioned that my first book was titled Paranormal Chronicles, Tales of Humor, Horror, and the Absolutely Strange. My second book is titled Haunted Chillicothe, which is all about Chillicothe, Ohio, where I live. And my third book, which is now available on paperback, is Haunted Holidays, and that's all about paranormal phenomenon and supernatural occurrences that take place between Halloween to New Year's Eve, also including Thanksgiving and Christmas. I'm currently working on my fourth book, which is all about Beaufort, North Carolina, called Haunted Beaufort, of course, not much of a stretch to the imagination on that title, and working on my first full-fledged novel, which I kind of uh, had to put on the shelf for a while as I work other things out with my fourth book and various other goings-ons in my life. So, suffering from an identity crisis, I'll ask, who am I? I'm an author who researches the uh, unusual, the strange, the unheard of. I write books based on this topic, and uh, my team and I, we do investigations and we travel throughout different locations to find out what people have been telling us about, or people send us emails on and ask us questions about strange or unexplained phenomenon. I conduct all of the research and investigation for my books, and we do not only investigate locally, but regionally, and when able, throughout the United States. My team's main focus is on ghostly and spiritual encounters and haunted locations. However, I do research UFO sightings, crop formations, and cryptozoological creatures such as Bigfoot, water monsters, giant birds, the Mothman, of course. I have been doing this kind of research for over 20 years. And why I do what I do, I was enthralled with fascinating stories of ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, and various other uh, tales relayed to me by my grandmother. And that it all started at a very early age for me. I started encountering spirits and ghosts around the age of five, as far as I can remember back. And between the age of five to eight, I started reading any and every piece of literature pertaining to ghosts, spirits, Mothman, uh, Bigfoot, UFO phenomenon, and the Bermuda Triangle. My interest and desire to understand what I was seeing continued well into my teen years. For most of my life, I have encountered unexplainable things, seeing things that no one else is seeing, hearing things, smelling phantom odors, aromas of that sort, that no one else notices, and sensing electrical impulses and energy sources. I was raised in church, and I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior at the age of 15. And my supernatural gift, I believe, became more intensified after that event as I continued to age through my teen years, well into my 20s, I started reading more scripture pertaining to spiritual gifts, angels, and demons. There was a time when I would often feel ostracized or judged by other Christians. When starting uh, sharing what I was experiencing, some fellow believers would tell me that they believed that the devil was trying to fool me into following him, 
However, I believe the Lord blessed me with this gift in order to educate and inform others on the issue of the paranormal. First of all, we do not, as a team, condone the use of Ouija boards to contact spirits. Secondly, we do not take part or contribute to seances. And then we do not open a line of communication with the dead. However, to be polite, if they approach us, then we rely on the spiritual gifts passed on to us in order to discern from the spirits and uh, allow uh, guardian angels, per se, to guide us, our own common sense and intuition. We start every investigation with prayer and end every investigation with prayer. Where I've been and what I'm doing and what I've done, we have conducted investigations all throughout Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, North Carolina, New York, Boston, Massachusetts, Salem, Gettysburg, Bar Harbor, Maine, and hundreds of other locations. Uh, as the MC stated earlier, I have appeared as a guest speaker at the 2008 and the 2013 Mothman Festival and the 2010 Ohio Paranormal Convention, several churches, libraries, and schools, and my books and our work uh, and research have been featured and chronicled on Fox News 28, ABC 6, The History Channel, and Cab News. I've written three books and I have so many more ideas to share and experiences to write about. These are what the covers look like if you hop on eBay, Barnes & Noble, or stop by my booth afterwards. I only have one copy left of Paranormal Chronicles. That's my first book. Since yesterday, a uh, great blessing took place. I sold out of everything I had, except for a few plush ghosts, which I'm selling those as well for commercial reasons. And my first book, I'm happy to take pre-orders, which I do quite frequently. Name, address, I have it shipped directly to you within a matter of a week and a half at the most. My first book was written and published in 2008. Second book was 2010, and as you can read from where you're sitting, 2012 was when Haunted Holidays came out. Now today, primary focus, Mothman, Gargoyles, Demons, and Angels. To start with, a bird or a plane, an in-depth history of winged beings, starting with the angels. Starting with the angels. An angel, from the Greek word angelos, is a supernatural being or spirit, usually in humanoid form, found in various religions and mythologies. The theological study of angels is known as angelology. They are often depicted as benevolent celestial beings who act as an intermediary, intermediaries and marys between heaven and earth, basically messengers of God, or as a guardian spirit or guiding influence. The term angel has also been expanded to various notions of spirits found in many other religions. Other roles of angels include protecting and guiding human beings and carrying out God's tasks. In art, the world of art, angels are often depicted with bird-like wings on their back, a halo, robes, and various forms of glowing light. Now this is known as the celestial order of the universe. If any of you are familiar with the book of Revelation, these are the angels that will break open the seals that will release the plagues upon the earth. These are the angels of warning, the harbingers of sorrow, basically. They are depicted as a man-like creature with six wings, another has a bird head, another looks like a, uh, a black Angus bull, and the other, of course, is said to look like a lion. And they all speak, um, not verbally, but through the mind. Readers of the scrolls, the seal breakers, and the bringers of destruction. Now here's the tricky one, demons. Satan always appears as an angel of light, and so do his minions. A demon is a, par is a paranormal, often malevolent being prevalent in religion, occultism, literature, fiction, and folklore. The original Greek word, daemon, does not carry the negative connotation initially understood by implementation of the koine, which is ancient Greek dialect, and later ascribed to any cognate word sharing the root in ancient Near Eastern religions as well as the Abrahamic traditions, including ancient and medieval Christian demonology. A demon is considered an unclean spirit, sometimes a fallen angel, a non-human spirit, or a spirit of unknown origin which may cause demonic possession, thus calling for an exorcism. In Western occultism and Renaissance magic, which grew out of Greek-Roman magic, Jewish demonology, and Christian tradition, 
A demon is a spiritual entity that may be conjured and controlled. Control, however, is very unlikely to occur. Anyone ever watch the movie Percy Jackson, The Lightning Thief? This is a very well known in Greek mythology, the Furies. Three goddesses of vengeance. Um, the avenger of murder, the avenger of jealousy, and the avenger of anger, constant anger, that is. They were also called the daughters of the night, but were um, actually the daughters of Uranus and Gaia. Another name for them is the uh, Uranes. Now back to the picture. Um, being that appears with wings flapping, coming at you, uh, death stare, almost like a grin, very similar to most of the depictions and or eyewitness accounts from some people who have claimed to have seen Mothman or as generations go on, those people who were eyewitness and or firsthand, had firsthand encounters with the uh, crypt winged cryptid creature uh, may compare that easily to it. Without mercy, the Furies would punish all crime, including the breaking of rules, considering all aspects of society. They would strike the offenders with madness and never stop following criminals. The worst of all crimes, according to them, was murder. The Furies would enjoy punishing this kind of crime. Gargoyles, we've all heard of them. Now, in the lower left-hand corner, how many people remember the movie from 1972 called Gargoyles? It's one of my favorites. According to myths and legends, real gargoyle creatures were very majestic and mysterious animals. They were stone statues during the day and magically turned into flesh and blood creatures during the night, much like the old, uh, from the 1990s, Disney cartoon of the same name, Gargoyles. The stone slumber was a way for them to rejuvenate themselves and even heal wounds accumulated from the previous night. Now let's go back to the way these things look. Very similar to uh, depictions of Mothman. Come on, work. Moving on to the Jersey Devil. Anyone familiar with the Jersey Devil? Jersey. Just say, I was thinking you might be from Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Jersey Devil. No, it's not Snooky. Rather, it's a flying bipedal horse, which is said to haunt the southern area of the Garden State. Tales of it have been passed along since the 1700s when a demon child was said to have been born of the Mother Leeds. She already had 12 children and said if she had a 13th, it would be from the devil. Sure enough, one dark and stormy night, she popped out her 13th and transformed into a creature with hooves and a horse's head, bat wings, and a forked tail. 300 years later, and it's still being spotted pretty regularly and recently as uh, September of last year. In 1960, a $10,000 reward was offered for its capture, but its greatest fame was in 1909 when thousands of people claimed to have seen the cryptid over a course of one week. Then another $10,000 reward was offered at this point, causing a hoax entry made by sticking wings on a kangaroo. Where in the world did they find a kangaroo in Jersey is what I would like to know. Popobawa, which is bat wing Swahili. Bat-like shape-shifting creature with one eye and a very large penis. I don't know why that's even... Anyway, said to stalk the men and women of Zanzibar, Africa. Can appear as a human or as an animal. The creature enters houses at night and sodomizes men, women, and children. Before leaving, it tells its victims to tell everyone in the village of its attack or risk it coming back for more. Popobawa. Stay out of, of uh, Zanzibar. Also, Popobawa is the name of an evil spirit which is believed by residents to have first appeared on the Tanzanian island of Pemba. In 1995, it was the focus of a major outbreak of mass hysteria and panic which spread from Pemba to the main island of Zanzibar. Across the Dar es Salaam and other urban uh, centers on the East African coast, Ahul. Anyone familiar with Ahul? Another winged cryptid. The Ahul is a flying cryptid, supposedly a giant bat, or by other accounts, a living pterosaur, or flying primate. Such a creature is not known to science, and there is no objective evidence that it exists as claimed. It is said to live in the deepest rainforests of Java, 
and is described as having large dark eyes, large claws on its forearms, approximately the size of an infant, and a body covered in gray fur. Possibly the most intriguing and astounding feature is that it is said to have a wingspan of 10 feet. This is almost twice as long as the largest known bat in the world, the common flying fox. Bat Squatch. Yes, there's actually a bat squatch. It's another flying cryptid. This is an alleged, uh, allegedly sighted near Mount St. Helens. It resembles a flying primate, similar to the Yahul and the Orang Batai of Southeast, Africa, uh, Southeast Asia. Although it is said uh, sighted only once for a brief moment, the witnesses allegedly took several pictures of the creature. However, these pictures have not been yet analyzed and thus cannot prove the creature's existence. <coughs> Owlman, another winged cryptid. The Owlman, sometimes referred to as the Cornish Owlman, or the Owlman of, Ma of uh, Monan, is purported cryptid that was supposedly sighted around mid-1976 in the village of Monan, Cornwall. The Owlman is sometimes compared to America's Mothman in cryptozoological encounters and literature. The Monan Church is built in the middle of a prehistoric earthwork. It suggested that the church may be built on a ley line, which is a straight line that passes through and links several ancient sites. And it's speculated that the appearance of the Alman may be a manifestation of the earth energy that is actually in this place. Now, moving on to what we all know and love here in Point Pleasant, Mothman. Gotta hit it really hard, I guess. Mothman is a winged creature reportedly seen in the Point Pleasant area of West Virginia from uh, November 15, 1966 uh, to uh, December 1967. The first newspaper report was published in the Point Pleasant Register dated November 16, 1966, titled Couple C Man Sized Bird Creature Something. Interesting title. On December 15, 1967, the Silver Bridge collapsed while it was full during rush hour traffic, resulting in the death of 46 people. Two of the victims were never found. The investigation of the wreckage pointed to the cause of the collapse being the failure of a single eye bar in the suspension chain due to a small defect of no more than 2.5 millimeters deep. Analysis showed that the bridge was carrying much heavier loads than it had originally been designed for and was poorly maintained. The collapsed bridge was replaced by the Silver Memorial Bridge, which we see today. That was completed in 1969. After the catastrophe of the bridge collapsed, the UFO sightings stopped, the Men in Black vanished, and the Mothman moved on. Now, let's move on to winged cryptids and entertainment. To the top left, you'll see from the cartoon series Ben 10 Alien Force, uh, two different characters in particular that are very close in uh, resemblance to the Mothman. And of course, like I mentioned earlier, in the lower left-hand corner of the movie, Gargoyles, uh, right next to that is another winged cryptid that appears in the Ben 10 Alien Force. The movie series Jeepers Creepers, which is about a winged creature that's half man, half bat, that uh, hibernates every 30 years and then comes back and uh, eats people, basically. Then you have the Fury at the top from the uh, uh, Percy Jackson series. Then you have Legion from uh, the movie Legion, which is the battle between angels and demons. And then the movie The Mothman Prophecies. New discoveries. This is something to keep in mind. So many people ask me, why do you bother looking for these things? Why do you believe in Bigfoot? Why do you believe in water creatures? Uh, things that have yet been discovered or proven by modern science. Each year, scientists record another 18,000 new species of plants and animals. In recent years, they've added about 70 new reptiles and 400 new fish annually to the world's databases of species. Even more discoveries of plants and invertebrates that come forward, biologists every year document about 2,000 new species of flowering plants and 13,500 new invertebrates. Fun factoids. To date, we have explored less than 5% of our own oceans. The ocean is the lifeblood of Earth, covering more than 70% of the planet's surface and driving weather, regulating temperature, ultimately supporting all living organisms. Throughout history, the ocean has been a vital source 
of sustenance, transport, commerce, growth, and inspiration. Yet for all of our reliance on the ocean, 95% of this realm remains unexplored and unseen by human eyes. This is one main reason why I think that these winged cryptids have some validity to them, and not everyone is hallucinating. According to National Geographic, 86% of the world's species are still unknown. And we live in the 21st century. Modern devices, modern technology, uh, we can be on our iPhone and get on, uh, if you have directtv.com, enter in your pen code and record TV shows when we're on the other end of the world from our iPhone. But we've not yet explored or discovered at least 86% of the world species. Are we within reach of finding all of the species, or are we way off? According to the experts and my own research, the answer is we are way off. The smarter we get, the dumber we become. When did we find it? The discoveries of the Western world. Gorillas, discovered in 1847. That was almost 20 years before the Civil War. Thought to be a creature of myth and legend, the Western gorilla was discovered by the American physician and missionary Thomas Stoughton Savage and naturalist Jeffries Wyman. The coelacanth. Coelacanths were thought to have gone extinct in the late Crustaceous period, but were rediscovered in 1938. That's between World War I and World War II, when we perfected the art of flying, when we have vehicles that we can drive around in from state to state. This was off the coast of South Africa. The panda bear. In 1869, French missionary... Armand Pierre David obtained a specimen of a giant panda from Sichuan. The giant squid, for the first time, photographed in 2004, captured on video for the first time in 2006. It is now 2013, and we've heard of these things for centuries existing. They've drawn earlier maps with these things popping up out of the water. Stories from sailors, stories from fishermen, uh, people out uh, in recreational uh, boating periods uh, describing these things, seeing these things. Do we have any questions? Or have I answered them all? <laughs> yes, you, sir. The minute uh, at the uh, TNT Depot? Just anywhere. Uh, we had, uh, I had one encounter at a crop formation in Peebles, Ohio, in 2003. I went out to do, just right after I got out of work, I decided to go and try to get into the formation to take some soil samples, look around, use some equipment. And as I'm approaching the field, there's not a soul anywhere. No cars, nothing flying over, no one in a hot air balloon. And this site where it appeared is directly across the road from the Serpent Mounds in Peebles, Ohio. And there's no cars in the parking lot. Uh, no one's there. As I enter the field, this voice pops out from behind me. And I turn to look. He's telling me to go ahead and get out of the field, put away my equipment, shut the camera off, and go home. And the individual was dressed in what looked like a state trooper outfit, but he did not have a name badge, he did not have a gun on him, he had the badge, but it was in the, uh, traditionally in the wrong spot where they pin a badge. It was in the wrong area, he didn't have any identification on him, nor did he have a cop car, a van, you name it. He was just standing there in the middle of the road, had dark sunglasses on, he was very pale in his complexion, and uh, had a crew cut, looked like uh, maybe a crew cut you'd see in the 1950s. And he just stood there with his arms folded, staring in my direction, but not at me, kind of through me, and asked me again to please get out of the field, shut off my equipment, get in my car, and go home. There's nothing to see here. <clears throat> and I am explaining to him that I have permission from the farm owner to be in here to take photographs, to take soil samples. And he said, I'll say it again. Gather your equipment, shut off your camera, please go to your car and leave now. So without further ado, I gathered everything, walked right past him, probably from me to that mic stand, 
And he just stood there, stoic, not saying or doing anything, just staring straight out into the field like he had been the whole time. I get in my vehicle, I start to drive away, and I can't help myself but to watch in my rearview mirror uh, what this man is going to do next. He walks down off of the road into the field, and as he enters the field, which the crop is about knee high, uh, he completely evaporates. And I stopped, got out, and I looked around, looked up top, I looked in the field, he was nowhere to be seen. So I, I decided not to waste any more time, got back in my vehicle, and just drove away. Interesting thing was, all of the stations on my radio were gone, uh, as if the preset had been changed. Like maybe the battery died, and then it turned back over, everything was gone. I had to reset the clock. Uh, my camcorder would not work from the beginning when I walked into the field. I couldn't get it to come on. It kept uh, kicking off like there was no battery power, but I had it charging with my car charger all the way over there to make sure I had enough power. Then I called the sheriff's department of that area, explained to him that I thought perhaps there was someone impersonating an officer, and he said according to his records and according to dispatch and anything that the state highway patrol would have going on, no one of uniform should be in that area at this point in time. You, sir. Yeah, I looked up, saw him walking the field, looked ahead to make sure I wasn't going to rear-end anyone or hit something, and looked back up again, he was gone. So I equate that to dematerialization. Okay, that's <laughs> You, sir. Um, how far back does your research go as far as, um, like, the fall of Satan and uh, even, like, the connection with Anunnaki or uh, the earlier Sumerian gods and stuff like that? I've uh, read a lot of the Book of Enoch, which was taken out of the original Dead Sea Scroll translation. Those were the part of the missing books of the Bible. Book of Enoch talks heavily about uh, the war between the angels and the fallen ones, talks heavily of uh, the creatures that um, supposedly dwelled here before, when it was a hostile and barren land before God came in and did what he did with it and turned it into what we know it as Earth today. Uh, almost as if it's a conspiracy between the fallen ones and the original inhabitants of this land to try and overthrow and destroy uh, human nature as, as we know it. Uh, that's about as far back as it goes. Now, as far as going to the Holy Land or going into any areas where these events took place, I've not had that luxury. You, please. Have you ever heard of anyone having physical contact with a uh, men in black, for example, let's say you approached the men in black in the field and held out your hand for a handshake. I can't imagine that he would shake your hand, but has anyone, maybe someone here, anyone heard of someone approaching a men in black and slapping them on the back or what would happen? Like giving him knocks or something? Yeah, something yeah. like that. I've never heard of anyone making physical contact with the alleged men in black. Uh, I don't know if maybe it's against their species, if they are a different species, or against their traditions to shake hands or to make any kind of physical contact, like maybe we're unclean creatures to them, and their job is to observe and to warn of uh, upcoming events. But according to the people locally here, the men in black were fairly abrasive and, and very strong and stern in their warnings to stop looking, there's nothing going on, you're not hearing this or seeing this. So I'm not entirely sure if they're connected to some kind of a splinter government group or if they're even connected to the human race as a whole. It seems like they might be shapeshifters too. You know, uh, you know how clumsy they are in trying to look like an officer. Mm -hmm. Who knows, it could be something that, some entity that maybe previously, just 10 minutes before, just scared someone and was flapping his wings or something. You know? Like a doppelganger, perhaps. Not like something that can change its appearance because you know the non physical aspect of it, like you said, it just appears in the thin air. Or, you know, a lot of us have heard of uh, something that appears like a flying saucer right before their eyes transforms into a helicopter, mm -hmm. a black helicopter. You know, it's always the black unmarked helicopter, right? Sure, but let's say you did try to shake a man in black's hand, they would 
if shaking their hand would give away their cover that they're not a police officer, that they're not a human, they'd probably try to avoid that because they're trying to impersonate. And what if you grabbed their hand and it's ice cold or you went right through their hand? You know, then you would know that they don't have authority as a police officer, mm -hmm. but it's another ultra terrestrial or something, you know. Yeah. So I think that'd be a good experiment, but who knows what'll happen to touch one of these guys. <laughs> You, sir, in the back. So that's a good question. The, the phenomenon of the black-eyed kids uh, crossed with the men in black. Uh, funny how black still exists with, within both of those uh, uh, phenomenons. The interesting thing about how I felt personally when I encountered uh, that being is kind of like the way you would feel as a child when you get caught in a lie and your parents are uh, questioning you on it and you know if you don't tell the truth finally you're going to get a, a whooping or something. And you've got that fear, the butterflies in your stomach. Uh, you're thinking, well, how can I get out of this situation? Do I tell another lie? That's kind of how I felt. I had that feeling of like an internal fear, like a fight or flight type fear. But on the outside, I didn't show it. The inside, my stomach was turning knots. I, I didn't, if this were a real officer, I didn't want to get maced or something. But at the same time, if this were not an officer, and someone impersonating an officer, what would they do to me? Or if there was something even worse, uh, one of those unmarked vans where some guy comes in and says, you want a puppy or some candy, are they going to abduct me? It's, it was a very fearful feeling, and it's not something I was comfortable with or wanted to experience ever again. You, man. First of all, I'm sorry that I called you ma'am. It's really hard to see up here. Uh, secondly, uh, to answer your question, I do have what I call a, a, like a kinetic spidey sense, and it doesn't happen everywhere I go. I'll go into certain areas that are supposed to be touched or haunted, and I feel nothing. I sense nothing. Now, the Low Hotel is one place where the minute I walk up the first set of stairs inside, I get that sensation, like i just been into a cool peppermint patty. But I... Uh, <laughs> I have to say, like with the crop formation in Bainbridge, Ohio, the one that I went to before the one in Peebles, I'm standing in the center formation portion, like the larger circle with everything else outlying around it because it was about 300 feet in diameter. And as I'm standing there, I have fillings in my teeth from when I was a kid and I ate way too much candy and didn't brush enough. And that was when they put more of like a metallic compound of, of a filling in your mouth back before they realized lead would kill you. And it was causing like this strange electrical charge, like this dull ache in my mouth. And after I left that area, I felt incredibly fatigued, like someone drained the energy right out of my body. My wife experienced the same thing as far as fatigue. And when we got home, we almost didn't make it. We were so tired. And it's no more than 20 minutes down the road, Bainbridge to Chillicothe. And the drive home, I was so tired, I almost nodded off behind the wheel several times. It was like we couldn't wait to get home and go to sleep. And I think that those areas that are highly charged with electromagnetic energy, highly charged with excessively high counts of radiation or limestone deposits, quartz crystal deposits, other earthbound type energies, or yet unidentifiable energies, can have a severe effect on certain people, not everyone. But I'm the kind of person who basically came into the world with this type of spiritual gift and or sensation or feeling of certain things that I can quickly identify, if I'm lucky enough to be open to it and, and tap into it, identify certain areas that are supercharged. You, sir, again. Have you, have you investigated or researched um, any type of uh, reptilian type uh, 
individuals or creatures? Or, and um, do you give any credence to like the research of David Icke and people like him? As far as the reptilian alien species, if they would be deemed as alien or original Earth and inhabitants, I've not investigated anything pertaining to that. I've read a lot on it to try and have a better understanding of what that species is. If it's uh, something that's been here the entire time or something from uh, a different dimensional plane, that's really only my level of understanding to it, just reading about it, not necessarily going out and seeking that. Because it could be something as simple as demonic in nature, because in the end times, uh, demons will perform miracles. Demons will commit acts that will confuse and fascinate at the same time. And the greatest author of confusion is Satan, demons being his minions. And it's something you always have to high, have a high level of caution when dealing with. And that's why they have me speak on Sundays, I guess. <laughs> you, ma'am. What does all this have to do, what you're just discussing about demons, and what does that have to do with haunted houses and ghosts? Haunted houses and ghosts, completely different playing field for some, but at the same time, it's a pseudoscience. It's something we do not fully understand, nor is modern science or credible science willing to acknowledge it as a possibility or as a plausibility. Uh, they do everything they can to dispute findings of this nature and everything to discredit people who research and investigate it and try to present facts, statistics, names, numbers, dates, places. Uh, we're, you know, we're basically like the Adams family in comparison to uh, modern or uh, re reputable science. But sometimes, uh, when it comes to pseudoscience, it's more accurate and more incredible than credible. Did that answer your question, I hope? <laughs> I guess, personally, with what you've experienced when you, like, say, go into a house that's supposed to be haunted, mm -hmm. what, what is your view of that? Or what have you experienced? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> the crazy thing about that, I have it narrowed down to several different possibilities. Um, some of the things people may be seeing could be angelic in nature, almost like a guide or a beacon to, to guide you where you need to be on a path that's been predestined for you. If you don't believe in predestiny, it's your choice completely. Uh, everything does happen for a reason, in my opinion. Uh, it could be something as malicious as a demon impersonating a lost loved one, impersonating what I call a familiar, to suck you into a darker part of research, a darker side of life, into the occult, needless to say, uh, promises of power, promises of fame, things of that nature, or paranature. Now, with, like, uh, suicides, uh, there's often remnants left behind from suicides, or incredibly uh, dramatic or hostile battles like Gettysburg, or perhaps the wreckage left behind from the Titanic, which artifacts have been brought up from the Titanic and displayed at various different museums. And people who work at these museums have encounters of things being heard. They're seeing things around and uh, with these artifacts there. So it's almost as if that energy used that to house itself. And by bringing it up, the energy continually replays itself. It's known as a residual. Uh, I, I think it could be an angelic, demonic, a residual occurrence or something like a spirit in limbo or in purgatory, that it's our job to try and help them find their way home by, if they present themselves, finding out what they're wanting. The way that I myself have researched and read when trying to decipher between uh, spirits and or angels and demons, if that entity you're encountering, you're like having a regular line of communication with, uh, if, if there's no clear reason why they're there, I often tell people, if it's not doing anything damaging, just ignore it. If, you, if it's bothering you, just ignore it. If it's not doing anything damaging. And if it starts hurting you or throwing things at you, it's you know time to get an exorcist involved or someone to come in and burn sage and pray around your house. Because it's obviously there for malicious reasons. Was that better? Okay. <laughs> All right. Are you meant. Ever have that, that 
Well, I mean, even as a believer uh, in, in many things, I'm full of questions, and that is the best thing you can do is question everything. And, you know, we live in a very unjust world where uh, perfectly innocent good people die every day while some jerk off down the road who uh, doesn't deserve to live continues to live and be prosperous. And, you know, that makes me really angry and question God a whole lot. But at the same time, I'm not him, and thankfully I'm not him because half the world would be gone because I get that angry. So when it comes to my internal spiritual struggles... Uh, I do a lot of praying, I do a lot of uh, studying, I, I read and study on everything, but I have to search within myself to truly understand what it is I'm dealing with before I go any further, and if it's something that I feel threatened by, or that it's there for the wrong reasons, I normally back off from that right away as to not be confused or seduced. Oh, yeah, everyone gets confused by that, especially when you consider so many parallels between, like, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity. They right. all have tales of the Great Flood. They all have tales um, that are similar to what's being told in uh, early Hebrew writings. And they all talk about a Messiah who's coming to save us all. They all mention some sort of a, of a, born, a son born of a virgin. Even in the Quran, they mention this. And... For me, myself, the faith in what I have faith in works for me on a personal note, and it keeps me steady and keeps my head up. Now, it doesn't necessarily work for everyone else, and I don't make it my job to try and convert anyone. I mainly state the evidence as I see it, and I present scientific data to back it up. And so many other people in, in my situation... They, a lot of the more evangelicals, they hate science. They see it as a, as a lie from Satan, that Satan put the dinosaur bones there. I think that's crazy. Uh, obviously, dinosaurs were here. Um, Satan didn't plant bones to confuse the people. So I, I'm open to any possibility, and I'm a Christian who believes in multiple realities, multiple dimensions, and time travel. Yes, I threw time travel in there. <laughs> You, please. First time I experienced what? Some uh, strange phenomenon like seeing a ghost or whatnot. When I was the age of five, it started with that, seeing my dead grandfather appear before me on the week of the anniversary with him, he, when he died. He died when I was three. I was told that he died from old age, that he was really sick and he died from old age. In fact, we were all told this. And the reality was, he committed suicide. So I saw him between the ages of three and eight, three, three to eight, three to nine, and saw him over and over again in the same situation. Um, lesions in his wrists and uh, lesions in his throat, because he had actually basically filleted himself. And I kept seeing it, and it would trouble me, it would bother me. But it was like he was reaching out to me. Every time I would see him, he was reaching out to me. So, you know, I had gone to VBS enough as a kid at that point in time, and uh, I was a part of the youth group as a little kid. Uh, it dawned on me to basically say a prayer for passing, as I would call it. Take him to where you need to take him. Get him out of here. He looks miserable. And from that moment on, um, I no longer saw him, but at that instant when he basically vanished and kind of turned to this strange white fog haze and just disappeared. The entire room smelled like roses. That's something I remember, uh, which after years of research and study, that's something that's commonplace with an exorcism or a uh, uh, blessing of a home when something finally is let go and it moves on. Uh, whether it be good or bad, uh, there's often a, a smell of roses. Okay. So I'll be at our booth. Uh, like I said, I only have one book left. I will go to the highest bidder. No, uh, I have one book left, and I'm taking pre-orders for books if you're interested. Uh, I'm not a scam artist. I don't sell snake elixir, and you will get your book if you pre-order it. Uh, my, uh, my word is my bond on that. So thank you so much for sitting here this long. And